This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code Epicenter to get 10% off your order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Mayor Roy. Today we are talking to the co-founders of Status. Status is one of the applications, mobile applications, that is pushing the boundaries of how the user interface to the dApp world should ought to look like. So let's get going and have an intro from Carl and Jared, starting with Jared. Jared, tell us a, a bit about yourself and how you got to be into the crypto space. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Jared. I've uh, been kind of following bit, like uh, the crypto space for a long time. I got into Bitcoin around sort of 2011 um, and uh, ultimately Ethereum. Uh, how I got into it is kind of a long story, um, but uh, there's... There's many paths that kind of all connect. Um, one of them is particularly around sort of virtual reality um, and this idea of, of these sort of companies owning, like owning these head-mounted displays that, which will ultimately turn into mixed reality devices. Uh, and so I view that our smartphones will eventually turn into these sort of wearable headsets. Uh, what's kind of scary to, about that to me is that companies are essentially going to own your eyes and your ears and ultimately what you see here think and, and believe. What's really interesting about sort of blockchains is this whole idea of being able to organize socially in unique and interesting ways uh, and have users being able to uh, not only own the software but have a, a stake within the, the direction of the software that can be created. Um, and that hasn't been able to be done pos like in a possible way without trust before uh, or some kind of intermediary. So that's what, that's what really excites me. Okay, cool. And Carl, something about your background? Yeah, I guess uh, I kind of took a fascination to, to Bitcoin uh, very early on as well, around the same time as Jared, and kind of always been very fascinated with organizational structures. And when I first read the Ethereum white paper, I think that was one aspect that really piqued my interest. And then that coupled with sort of being exposed to a lot of Jared's thinking, um, just because we've known each other for such a long time is kind of what yeah, sent me, sent me down the rabbit hole. And so what led you to want to build a, a messaging app, essentially, on, on top of Ethereum, or I should say a wallet as a messaging app? Sure. So I guess it's really about how can we kind of begin to onboard non-technical people into using decentralized applications. And we spend a lot of time thinking about what the UX should look like and how that's actually going to play out. And so, like, first of all, it just makes sense to focus on mobile, in my opinion. Um, that's where most of the users are today. And in terms of interface, if you actually look at how people are using their phones right now, um, it's very, very social. And most of that is training towards messengers. So I think it's just if you're one, trying to cast sort of the widest net and begin onboarding people into the blockchain and still have this very flexible sort of user interface. I think messaging makes sense. Um, if you contrast that with just a wallet, I, I think just opening up your wallet many times a day, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, whereas I might open something like Facebook Messenger over and over again. And uh, I mean, getting to that point, there's actually like a whole journey behind that. Um, I mean. First off, Status isn't really a wallet on its own. It does like account management, but like a wallet is like a dApp within Status. Um, we originally had the idea uh, for an unreleased product back in 2013. It was a sort of side project while we're focusing on our main project. Uh, it was going to be called Coin Hero, and it was going to be essentially a Bitcoin-based uh, browser for uh, mobile. Um, but a lot of the things we wanted to do uh, wasn't also possible. Like uh, we're looking at things like Mastercoin and Counterparty a little bit later on, uh, and like color coins were sure quite interesting, uh, but you couldn't really do them in an SPV way on the device itself. And then like uh, later when Ethereum came along, I was just like, wouldn't this be so awesome to have smart contracts on your phone? Uh, and so we got a small dev grant from the foundation to, to port the Java version to Android uh, since 
uh, coding in Java is the sort of default there. Um, and at the time, we were syncing the full blockchain, uh, which was kind of crazy. Uh, we even got it running on a smartwatch at one point, but uh, ultimately wasn't uh, super practical until the light client protocol came along. Cool. No, I mean, I, I agree with you, Carl, that, you know, the, there's a tendency right now for a lot of applications and sort of user interfaces to be built on top of chat. It, it's sort of like when you think about it, you know, if you look at sort of the progression of user interfaces, it seems so counterintuitive. But then again, it's just so natural um, to, to want to use a chat interface because, you know, you, you're so used to, to having a, a um, a textual dialogue with people. I mean, we, we text all day long. Why not have that same sort of interface for dialogue with, you know, an application such as, such as a DAP or a, a wallet or something of that nature. And, and also, you know, I think, I think you're, to your point, it's, um, it's much more pleasurable to be looking at this type of application than a wallet. I mean, I personally kind of, you know, try to stay away from my banking applications, this sort of stuff, because it's just so unpleasant. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that it's a very unique approach, uh, that is, that sort of speaks to people, right? Like people are, people are used to these interfaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's a interesting example of this is, is WeChat has basically already done this in a centralized fashion across China. They released this really fascinating report a couple of days ago. That's basically just looking at sort of different trends of users with inside the application. And you can see something like, uh, for example, the number of people that spend above two hours a day inside of WeChat has doubled since last year. The number of people spending two hours a day has doubled to four hours. It's like uh, this, the sheer number of people that are spending all of their time inside of this application is, is really fascinating. And now with, with WeChat, it's very like tightly sort of integrated with all these local services around China. So you can do things like book all your public transport, you can book uh, taxis, you can pay at a restaurant, you can order your food on your phone while at a restaurant. And I think this is the sort of direction that we'd eventually like to see status head. But you know, for now, we need to focus on, on getting the basics right. No, absolutely. And you know, with the advent of AI as well, like I, I have friends of mine who are working on uh, on sort of chat and AI, and you know, that it seems that it's going in that direction. Many many years ago, uh, there was another project that uh, did something similar to what you're doing, uh, which was Gems. Of course, that project was built on a totally different network. It was built on Counterparty, and I think the you know the objectives of the projects were of the project were much different. They were building a chat application in which you had a wallet. Have you sort of Pulled inspiration from other projects uh, such as Gems or perhaps you know, like WeChat. Uh. Oh yeah, definitely WeChat. Uh, once, like, uh, once I started using it and saw the potential of it, it was uh, definitely uh, awe-inspiring. Uh, we didn't become aware of Gems until much later on. Um, I, I think it's kind of interesting, but maybe the the sort of incentivization structures around that don't necessarily line up. Maybe it's kind of hard to onboard users into a new sort of token. That, not too many people are invested in, in the first place. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not I'm not so familiar with gems, but I, I think what's the real value proposition that Status is providing is really access to decentralized applications. And I'm not sure what what gems was doing exactly, um, but I don't think it was really aiming to provide a window into that sort of ecosystem. Yeah, I think they were doing something completely different. I mean, like I said, they were building a, a more of a, a chat application in which you had a wallet where you could easily send funds from from people in you know with, with people in your contact list um and you know n now years later they've sort of haven't really delivered on on what their initial vision was uh but i think it was a, an interesting perhaps precursor to you know what we're seeing now in terms of interfaces and to what you guys are doing which is obviously uh much more of a you know a, lo a, a broader vision into how decentralized applications can live in chat interfaces Last year when I was at DevCon, I, I saw a talk from Jared and he mentioned that um, Status started off uh, trying to port over Mist to, to mobile, right? Like with the old app browser concept and then it ended up changing to a, a chat, uh, chat based interface. So I think like you are one of the teams that, are un that have analyzed what would happen if you would have like a normal DAP browser like Mist on mobile versus chat based. 
uh, BAP interface. So what's what's the what's the key difference between these two, and what are the strengths and disadvantages of each? I, I think uh, what's important to to note that Status still tries to be this sort of mist for mobile. Um, right now, like we have like a browser within Status, um, and we actually treat the even though we have a primarily chat interface, each chat can also be considered uh, like a tab in a browser. So the idea is that um, you have this sort of browser interface, but you can pull it down. And in the chat history, you'll be able to see the sort of transactions that that particular DAP has been performing on your behalf. Um, and, you know, and maybe later on that can be expanded to have like customer support for the particular DAP, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so, so yeah, like uh, we're definitely tr uh, still striving to be MIST for mobile. Uh, we couldn't port like MIST directly uh, to to mobile uh, because it's pr it's primarily developed. Uh, in an Electron sort of environment. Uh, Electron itself is, is kind of a sort of basically a Chromium wrapper around uh, some HTML and JavaScript. Uh, and when you're in a resource constricted uh, environment, that becomes very, very difficult to get a high performance, um, uh, high performance, sort of a high performance user experience that's sort of smooth and running really well. And we're already running, like we run Go Ethereum directly on the device and it's syncing directly with the Ethereum network. Uh, which is already quite taxing in of itself with proof of work. Uh, when we get to proof of stake, that changes. But uh, we basically had to opt for a, a better sort of uh, library for doing user interface, which is React Native, um, and it, it's working out really well. And, and to your question of sort of a browser versus messenger, I think it really just comes down to the way that people use their different devices. Like Mist has done really, really incredible job on desktop, and I think for or at least in our opinion, for mobile, um, just the way we use our phones is a little bit different. So we're taking this sort of hybrid hybrid approach. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, when you look at um, how the, the the app breakdowns are in terms of monthly active users, it's just that messengers dwarf uh, mobile browser usage by like, almost like a factor of three. Um, it's just people who are literally spending their lives communicating on their smartphones within some kind of messenger environment. And if you want to maximize the surface area of Ethereum to, to use this, really you need to kind of bring this familiarity uh, to them and, and then kind of slowly on, slowly kind of onboard them into this sort of world of blockchain without that being too intimidating um, and, and too forceful um, or even necessary to just use the application itself. So coming back to the, uh, the chat application space, I, I wanted to ask you one, one question. I mean. There are just a, a ton of chat applications. So you've got, I mean, obviously like Facebook Messenger, um, WhatsApp, like WeChat, and there's Signal and Telegram. And a lot of these are off, uh, often then geographically sort of, you know, specific uh, based on your country or region. I mean, personally, and then SMS, obviously, and the different SMS protocols. So you've got like, you know, Apple Messenger protocol, like just it's just a mess of protocols and, and applications that are not interoperable for the most part. Uh, I just found out recently actually that WhatsApp is using the Signal protocol, which I guess is a thing, and but for some mm. reason is not compatible with the Signal application. Um, but so you know, personally, I I use like at least three or four, maybe five different applications uh, to chat with different people. Um, you know, where where do you see this evolving? Do you see the this space is you know just burgeoning with other applications and people are using like ten different messaging applications based on specific use cases or uh, the types of people they have on their list, or do these converge some into some you know major platforms where you know you don't have to use all these apps but just one? The, the ecosystem for messengers is quite interesting. Um, it, we actually looked into that originally because it's it, the, as a similar question that comes up is, well, why don't you just integrate with some other kind of messenger? Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, a lot of them are just essentially closed platforms. Um, basically, if you develop for that particular platform, one, you have to start acquiring users for your, your plugin to that. Uh, but it's at that point, um, it, it's centralized to start off with because they have the users have to have permission to go through your particular service to be able to use the cryptocurrency. 
um, and one that can just be kind of taken away from you very quickly, which is kind of a problematic. Um, the other part of that is with status, we, we think that the, the messengers um, protocols can be now peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Um, I think really Skype was the only people who were doing that uh, a long time ago. I mean, there's, come, there's some other interesting ones like Utox uh, that are kind of doing this sort of peer-to-peer -peer sort of stuff. Um, but apart from that, a lot of them are still using sort of this sort of client-server methodology. And maybe that's not necessary anymore. Um, and so we'd like to experiment and, and see how far we can push that with Whisper, which um, is, is really fascinating sort of protocol. In terms of answering the question of where this sort of ecosystem is going, uh, I think that the, the idea of messengers and chat interface is going to, uh, like on a much broader timeline, like be five or ten years out, we're, we're going to see more uh, socially aware computing and contextually aware computing. Uh, and right now we're just being bombarded with information. Like uh, if, if I open up my email, it's just filled with tons of emails. If I open up, like, I mean, if I'm on Reddit, it's just a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of not relevant to me. If I open up Slack, there's a whole bunch of messages. It's just, we're just getting bombarded with information. Uh, and I think the way that we're going to have to start curbing that is by making our computing very uh, contextually aware. Uh, and that becomes really fascinating how you kind of do that. Um, and then you start having to think about things like attention to be able to solve that. And attention is going to become like a, a real kind of valuable asset that we have uh, where our time and, and what we think and what we think about it has value because it's bound to time. Uh, we only have a certain amount of hours per day. And if it's kind of being bombarded with advertisements and that sort of thing, um, that's, that gets more and more problematic in our current Web 2.0 kind of world. So, I mean, ultimately, I think messengers uh, will continue to branch out. I had mentioned sort of mixed reality devices. Uh, I think ultimately uh, messengers will kind of merge or converge with the sort of uh, desktop environments of our, uh, these augmented reality devices, uh, and they will be contextually aware of their environment we're in, and they will be displaying things that are relevant to us to, to help us um, navigate our, our new worlds. Will we even have messengers when we have like augmented reality or I guess like augmented reality will have its own kind of messengers, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, the, the kind of key parallel there is that when you're in a chat, like it's a context, it's a context. Um, and, and Carl had alluded to how WeChat is kind of used. Uh, if you think about how it's used in China, like uh, you can order sort of uh, um, an Uber equivalent or a car to go to a restaurant. Um, you can be in a group chat and uh, organize that place, send the location. Uh, you can both see your progress on, on getting to that location. Um, but then when you're in the restaurant, then you can also order, like within that group chat, you can order at the restaurant and share the menu with your friend who can also order, even though he may be running 10 minutes late. Uh, so this is like a whole sort of social context that you're in. And if you can imagine where that social context is going to go into, that's going to start blurring uh, this line between our digital lives and reality a lot more. Um, and so I think there's going to be a very natural progression between the messages we see on our smartphones today and these sort of mixed reality devices where that then becomes part of your, essentially your awareness uh, and the sort of, like, this sort of context that's around, uh, around your field of vision at the time. So let's, let's move on to kind of understanding what the technology behind status is now. So you mentioned that you use the Whisper protocol in order to facilitate your chat. Now tell us what Whisper is. Whisper is a, a really cool uh, sort of communication protocol. It's uh, originally uh, invented by Gavin Woods in the early days. Um, it's, it's something between like UDP and a, a sort of distributed hash table in the sense that uh, it has some interesting properties on how you try to get messages from one place to another. Um, it has essentially dark routing and it doesn't reveal endpoints so easily. So for example, if I want to send a message to you, uh, I, would, uh, I would have your public key, which is a reference. I encrypt the message uh, with your public key um, and then I'll send it out into the network. Now this message will essentially bounce, uh, bounce around the no uh, nodes uh, for a specific TTL or time to live, and then it will die. Um, now 
basically there's no guarantee of message delivery in this. So even though you may receive your message, you still pass it on. And uh, if you don't receive it, well then, tough biscuits, right? Um, but there's these other ideas of doing uh, dark routing. Um, and so it's not implemented today, but it will be this idea of bloom filters, where you kind of uh, create this sort of bloom filter that uh, you can share with the nodes that you connect to, uh, basically letting them know what kind of information you're, you're interested in. And so basically these messages will bounce, this node will receive it and see if it matches that balloon filter, and if it does, it will send it your way, or, um, maybe, or maybe not. Um, it's all probabilistic. And um, another part of that is the, the network is supposed to learn what kind of uh, nodes are servicing your messages uh, better. So over time, the network topology should change uh, to be able to service uh, your messages faster, given your your length of time within the network and, and understanding what kind of nodes are, are good for you. And to, to combat the this sort of no guarantees on the message, essentially uh, we've implemented an application protocol in status which allows you to send uh, an acknowledgement or an ACK. Uh, and so basically you, you re-transmit the message until you have gotten a receipt back from the peer that you're talking to. And then there's some other, there's some, uh, in Whisper version 5, which is now being kind of rolled out, uh, there's some other interesting things like offline inboxing, um, but they're all quite experimental. And of course, we're experimenting with them. In fact, we're using it to, uh, to do push notifications later on uh, down the line. So I'm not, I'm not super familiar with Whisper, but uh, what, so what type of latency could we expect then? So if I send you a message and then you presumably receive it, uh, and then you send me back the ACK. Um, are we looking at the same type of latency as with like a traditional centralized client server type of scenario or would it be some a little bit longer? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I guess it kind of really depends on the network topology that you enter in at the time. Um, the idea is that it'll be like a couple of seconds, um, but it could be more, it could be less. Um, in terms of scalability, it's kind of like the biggest concern with Whisper at the moment. Uh, and we have a couple of other tracks that still keep it decentralized. We're talking with uh, uh, Sw the Swarm team, um, and they're, they're rewriting their network stack at the moment, and they're doing another protocol called uh, PSS, which um, essentially has, it, it, they're doing it to service sort of Swarm uh, message transmission, uh, but it'll also have a Whisper-like API. So within status, uh, if you're finding that um, the, the sort of privacy features of Whisper aren't servicing you well, it's, it's becoming too lag, you can choose between privacy and convenience and switch over, uh, hopefully in the future you'll be able to switch over to PSS, which will give you unicast and multicast, and uh, it, it should be blistering fast. So, so Whisper's big advantage is, like normally like, I think, you know, lots of messaging protocols and you generally have some form of like messaging broker that is going to aggregate the messages that come and then deliver them to the devices that they need to go to, yep. right? And this is like a central party. So from your description, um, Whisper's strength seems to be that there's no central broker of, of messages at all. It's it's, exactly. it's a pure, pure P2P network, yep. right? And then because it's a P2P network, there has to be public key crypto in it. Exactly. So there's there's not really a centralization point, uh, which is fantastic. Um, that way, sort of metadata collection is is somewhat mitigated, or it's non-trivial to, to do dragnet surveillance on it as easily. Um, and yeah, there's, there's asynchronous um, encryption, which is the sort of public key stuff. But there's also this uh, sorry uh, asymmetric encryption uh, to do the, the public key stuff. But there's also symmetric encryption as well. Uh, for sort of forward secrecy and that sort of thing, but um, Whisper doesn't specify that. You have to do. You have to roll it yourself or do it yourself. And uh, we'll be essentially implementing parts of the what's called the noise protocol uh, to do forward secrecy, which is a variant of the Diffie-Hellman um, encryption scheme. I think last January or something, I did, I actually downloaded Status, and uh, I was surprised to find that. Um, Status was actually syncing the whole blockchain and it was super fast and I was wondering how like how do you actually interface with the blockchain and how do you make all of these uh, mobile devices sync with it? 
Sure. I mean, so when you're running status, you're actually running an Ethereum node. It is literally Go Ethereum uh, on your device. Uh, what's really great about it is you're not syncing the full blockchain. Uh, you're syncing just the blockchain headers. Um, and that's because of the light client pro protocol that's being developed, uh, short, short for LES. Um, so so that what's really cool about that is it, it's... It, you, you're essentially doing all the same sort of cryptographically verifiable stuff just in a very light way and you're not running all the smart contracts and you're not doing all the heavy lifting. Um, but it's still quite secure because of the data structure. So yeah, like you, you basically you connect to a couple of bootstrap nodes then you connect to peers just like you would running Geth or, on, or like a normal sort of node on the network. Um, we've now implemented uh, this sort of with every release, we now update uh, what's called the CHT or the canonical hash tree, uh, and that allows us to essentially um, put in a checkpoint in the blockchain. So you only have to sync like um, like a week's worth or a month's worth of blocks to be able to to catch up. Um, so you don't have to go and sync the entire blockchain headers. That saves on that bandwidth and that saves on disk space, and it's still quite secure. Um, and the Elliot, like even though we're doing that with every release. Um, there's a whole, but there's a research topic around doing a dynamic CHT for light clients, um, and you know, so hopefully that will be dynamic in the future. Uh, and uh, when we switch to proof of stake, like uh, the, the story changes as well, but for the better. So, are you then sort of the first application that is set to go live that is uh, implementing in a real world production scenario this? Uh, this light client implement implementation? Yeah, I mean, so far we're the only ones that are actually treating decentralization seriously on mobile. Uh, and we, we were using uh, the light client before there was even an API for Geth uh, on Java or, or Objective-C. So if you look at it, like if you look at our library status Go, which consumes Go Ethereum, uh, we have our own sort of set of APIs to connect, with, um, to, connect to, the, to the network. It's kind of interesting. So quite recently, Coinbase released this mobile app called Token. And mm -hmm. as soon as it was released um, on our, on our slash Ethereum, there was a conversation that Token is very similar to, to Status. So could you give us a, like a rundown of um, how Token differs from Status in, in, the, in the same, in delivering their similar looking capabilities? Sure. I mean, so... I think what's really cool about Token is it's great for the uh, the ecosystem, uh, the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, I think the technology stack differs somewhat. Uh, they do use the Signal protocol, and that's somewhat centralized. Um, I don't believe they support Web3 at the moment. Um, and to interact with the network, you essentially go through a, a trusted server of theirs. So so your strength on, on, on this side is because you use Whisper, um... You don't have that central point of messaging trust at all, unless yep. unless the user opts in for convenience over over privacy. Yeah, and, and that, I mean that doesn't even exist yet. Um, so we're still waiting for the swamp guys to catch up and, and work on that. So that probably won't even happen this year. Yeah. Okay. So in general, tell us tell us about your ap approach to privacy and like uh, what kinds of data on your users do do you collect? We take a hard stance on this, uh, towards decentralization. Uh, we essentially don't want to see any of your data. Uh, at the moment, nothing is shared with our servers except for the phone. Uh, if, you, if you choose to, it's completely optional. You can opt to have uh, sort of contact synchronization. Uh, and the, the reason why that has to go through a server is because we have to send you an SMS uh, to verify that your phone number is actually yours. Like to do that in a decentralized way, it becomes awfully complex. I actually had some lengthy discussions about this, but you end up creating these crazy markets. Um, then you're sharing this sort of private information um, on the network, which is, is like your phone number, which you probably don't want to do. Uh, the good news is, um, in terms of uh, contact sharing itself, is uh, we've got like a we basically got a plan or a proposal to essentially do this in a trustless uh, and zero knowledge way. Well, somewhat, no, uh, basically zero knowledge way, um, with the exception of creating some hash collisions. But the idea is that uh, you'll be able to share contacts, uh, but not be able to 
uh, you'll be able to like upload that sort of data onto Swarm, and it won't matter because it's almost meaningless to anybody else except for you and, and your friends. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting, uh, but we'll still ultimately have to send you some kind of SMS. Yeah. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll let Ledger CEO, Eric Larchevêque tell you all about how simple the Nano S makes it to securely store all your private keys. The Ledger Nano S is our latest generation hardware wallet. This is a multi-currency hardware wallet. It has a screen and buttons to manage everything on screen. You can generate a new seed, restore a seed, or set up your pin on the device. Your seed will never be exposed to the host computer. On the Nano S, you have different apps. You have the Bitcoin app, you have the Ethereum app, and you have the Fido U2F app for strong authentication, for instance, with Google, Dropbox, or GitHub. You can manage your cryptocurrencies with the Ledger Wallet Bitcoin Chrome app or the Ledger Wallet Ethereum Chrome app. With the Nano S, all your Bitcoin and Ethereum addresses are derived from one unique seed. With one seed, you can have in the same time Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic balances. And also, if you restore your seed, you will also recover all the keys associated to other apps such as Fido U2F, SSH, GPG. So it's very simple, just one seed and multiple applications. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER. So moving on then to status itself and sort of the user interface. So I, I, I tried to get status on my phone. I, I, was, I wasn't signed up for the beta, so I couldn't, um, I couldn't install it. Alpha. Uh, or sorry, the alpha. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't install it, but I, I did look at the screen, the screen grabs on the website and sort of got an idea for you know, what the interface was going to look like and what are the types of things that you could do with it. And, and Mayor, I, I know the mayor has been using it, so maybe, maybe he can um, give some more insights as to what types of functionalities are in there. Um, but it, it looks like you guys spent a lot of time on design and user experience and just getting that really polished so that when somebody onboards this, like he's not thinking this is an Ethereum client or something like that. Like this is a, an actual application that serves per, uh, serves a purpose and that purpose is being able to interact with you know, other members of the community, uh, sending ether um, and then using applications, right? So using applications like Uport, um, and so walk us through what, you know, what is the experience on status and what types of things can you do, uh, once you've downloaded and installed the application? Sure. So, I mean, like once you download and install the application, uh, you go straight into a onboarding session, which is essentially a chat session with, uh, a, your first contact, which is uh, called console. Uh, it's called console because it tries to emulate the JavaScript environments of Go Ethereum. So you can actually type in JavaScript commands into there if you want to. Um, you have full access to Web3, so you, like, if you're a developer, you can kind of just muck around in that. Um, but what's great about it for just the average user is that it essentially tries to teach you the basics of interacting with status. Uh, so you learn how to touch on messages, you type in your password, um, set up your first account, that sort of thing. Uh, once you're done with that, uh, then you kind of move into the, the rest of the application um, and you can go over to your contacts and you will find a whole bunch of dApps that are ready to go. So like, I mean, you can access Augur, you can access Bchat, uh, you can access Ethlance, Gnosis, Flight Delay Suck, uh, First Blood, Auction House, blah, 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 blah. So these are all HTML sort of web dApps that you can literally just tap on and automatically start using on your mobile fo phone wherever you are. And of course, if you've done these sort of co uh, phone contact syn synchronization, you can chat with your friends and you can send and receive Ether. Uh, you have like a wallet uh, that uh, you can use as well. Uh, that's pretty much it to start off with. Um, the other feature that we've been working on is the uh, one called Discover. And uh, Discover is, is the, sort of this idea of, uh, actually it's where the name status is kind of coming from, but we haven't really kind of publicized it too much. But the idea is that uh, 
we want a, uh, the Ethereum community or anyone using Status to be able to find each other quite quite easily, but we want to do it through your friend network. So if you decide you want to advertise like a good or, a good or service, you can essentially change your status to have these sort of hashtags in it. Uh, and these hashtags will publicize your status amongst your friends. And that will propagate out from your friends to your friends of friends, etc., etc. And everyone will start sharing their, their uh, basically a top list of 100 public statuses with their friends themselves. Um, ultimately, what this means is, is you'll see uh, this sort of live feed of different hashtag based sort of statuses pop up within Discover and you'll be able to find cool new people to chat with, uh, offering different services nearby you, and this sort of thing. Um, and we're actually going to be evolving this to turn it into more of like a, a maps-based uh, layer system, uh, so other third-party dApps can start adding more information into, into this particular Discover feature as well. Yeah, that sounds really cool. So then this Discover feature would basically be sort of like a trending topics list of hashtags in that people have left in their status um, in their sort of circle of friends. Yep, and it's kind of it's like weighted by like how recently it was done, how like uh, if you're online or not, if that user has actually interacted with that person, that sort of thing. Okay, so coming coming back to the applications, uh, so you mentioned you mentioned Augur uh, as one of the applications that uh, is currently uh, compatible with Status. So first, I want to ask you, what, what does onboarding... So I'm, I'm, I'm an application developer. I, I've got the cool new dApp, you know, that just raised uh, 150 million in Ether. And, uh, you know, I, I, want, to, I want to integrate uh, into status. Um, what, what do I need to do? Is, that, is there like a development platform there? Or how, how do I onboard there? Sure. I mean, so status tries to be a browser... So in terms of integrations, it's just a matter of just like browsing to a website. That's, that's it. Um, we do have uh, plans for a DAP directory, um, but we want to do, do it right because there's a lot of sort of subtleties to that. Um, app stores themselves actually are riddled with a whole bunch of problems, and that sort of initial screen real estate is very highly valuable, and so there's a very strong incentive to be gamed on that. Um, and so we're looking at things like community curation and, and things like attention to be able to solve that. Um, but ultimately, uh, you'll essentially be able to kind of just deploy your, your, uh, your DAP as on Swarm or IPFS, that sort of thing, or just an, on a normal server. Um, and if it works in Mist or MetaMask, it should work in Status. Uh, if you want to do some more interesting things like decentralized chatbots or whatever, then... Uh, you will have to go through a username system, which we haven't, uh, which is not yet implemented, but it's on it's on our to do list of a very long to do list, um, and then so that's how you essentially access these sort of uh, chatbots and other users. So you said if it's if it's compatible with Mist or MetaMask, it, it should be compatible with Status. Yep. So so then I presume that so if I launch into Augur, I'm I'm being served uh, an interface which is sort of an application interface and not necessarily like a native chat. Like I'm not chatting with a sort of Augur bot and saying like, I want to predict, you know, I want to enter this prediction market and I want to bet this much on this prediction by sending text messages or text messages. Basically you're saying it's, it's more of an application interface that's more sort of classic to, or native to that application. Yeah, exactly. So, so, I mean, if you can think of like the sort of chat interface as being like a hybrid between a chat and a browser tab, that's probably the best way to start like wrapping your head around this idea. So, and the reason for that is because uh, you, you as a as a user, you want to make sure that you can kind of see the transactions that a particular DAP is doing within that context. So basically, like if you look at the, I don't know if you can see it here, but uh, you can see that this sort of no, it's a terrible example, but there's a Gnosis website actually on the screen. Uh, but if you can kind of pull this down then there's this sort of chat context behind it, which will end up showing a bunch of transactions. Uh, it doesn't right now, but it will in the future. Okay, so you you interact with um, sort of native application interface. You know, the, the, as an application developer, you may want to tweak that a little bit so that it works, you know, so that it's, yep. it, it's, it's um, uh, easy to use on, in, in a mobile phone. 
but then you're s- it's coupled with a chat um, feed that is sending you some some transact like sort of basic confirmations for transactions. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so any sort of like transactions that that DAP will make will end up in that uh, in that sort of chat history. So it's kind of like a, a per DAP transaction history. That's how we intend to intend to have that ultimately. Um, doesn't exist like that exactly today, but that's the sort of direction we're going. Okay. And then there might be certain instances where it's just a chatbot. So the idea is that there's a lot of flexibility. So we can have both web dApps and chatbots, and then there'll be use cases that kind of combine the two. Yeah, so exactly. And there'll be like hybrids. So for example, our, our next iteration of the wallet, which is a dApp, um, and it loads up in a web page, um, but it also has a whole bunch of commands that you can use within the chat context itself. So it's kind of like this uh, combination between the, between the two. So an, another example of that would be um, just showing Gnosis. Perhaps at some point when they have a chatbot on the platform, I could be chatting with Jared, and I could put at Gnosis, and then I could place some kind of um, social bet with Jared. So there's going to be these really interesting ways that these different dApps sort of operate on the platform within social context as well. I mean, like, that's the, like, uh, what's really interesting about uh, all these dApps being on top of like the single blockchain is you get all these different synergies. So later on, maybe in the distant future, you can have compositions of dApps sort of kind of chatting amongst themselves within chat history, like within chat context, uh, making very complex interactions, which would be really fascinating to see. Yeah, and these kinds of interactions are just not there in most of the other messaging apps, right? Because I think the most that's, that's there is like you can pay using a chat app, but prediction market using chat. And I guess I guess at some level, like when the technology advances a lot, um, for you, integrating the next app is just going to be very easy. So, yes. Okay. So basically like, in, in, in some senses, it's like, yes, status from the outside looks like a messenger app, but behind status, there's this Ethereum network that keeps improving as more and more dApps develop and status basically inherits all of those capabilities like free of cost. So exactly. ultimately, ultimately, like it's like your application is just getting capability after capability after capability while you personally don't incur much cost in developing all these and because your sense of ca- your capabilities are rising much faster than the other chat based apps that kind of triggers adoption of some kind yeah much like a, a web page like i could be using firefox for many years and just um reaping the benefits of how the internet's evolving cool cool so uh that's that's that's, that's really cool um Recently, I was at your Reddit and um, I came across this I, this uh, one of these posts where uh, somebody was mentioning that you're going to launch a network of your own, the status network. Uh, can you tell us what this network is, what, what the plans for it would be? It's still on the Ethereum public blockchain. Let's uh, make that very clear. It's an ERC-20 token um, and it's going to be modular, um, but I, probably Carl has uh, some more details you'd like to talk about? Sure. So we're just kind of thinking about these new sort of economic models that we can create um, through this token issuance. So there are very simple examples of how you could use a token within the context of status. So for one, just registering your username, for instance, could be done with the status network token. But there are these other problems that we're trying to solve as well. So um, one of which, and we've been in conversation with Mache from user feeds about, is this idea of content ranking. And if you look at content ranking in Web2, um, there's some, some clear problems that exist. So one of which is, is that there is a monopoly on the way in which your content is organized. So if I don't like the way that Twitter is ranking the information that I see, there's not really much I can do about it. And so we think this sort of monopoly isn't really in the spirit of decentralization. And if I don't like the algorithms that's being used to sort the information that I see, I should be able to switch it very easily. Um, so that's, that's one component. What's a, what's a running theme uh, within, within status is 
we've been open source from the beginning. Uh, we've always like everything is open source. We've also built out uh, this other other application called CommitF, which acts as a sort of bounty bot for for GitHub repositories, um, and any sort of GitHub user can use it. But the idea is that if an issue is created, uh, you can assign a bounty to that, and CommitF will come along and leave a comment with a QR code and a particular uh, bounty address. Um, then anyone can kind of contribute to that. The idea is to incentivize open source uh, development, uh, and that development can be paid out once uh, a pull request satisfies that particular issue has been merged into the develop branch by the project maintainer or whatever the, the situation is. And, and, and really what's, what's behind that is this idea of doing decentralized governance. Now, decentralized governance is like a really hard problem. Uh, we, ha don't, we don't believe that anyone's really solved that perfectly well. Uh, but what we can do is we can make steps to go towards that. Uh, so you can do things like uh, carbon vote style voting schemes uh, on particular proposals or particular issues. Uh, and, and the idea is to that uh, when you look at sort of social networks today, like things like Facebook, um, they're, they're essentially social, like these, these sort of huge networks of users, but they have an owner. Uh, and it's not them, like it's, it's some entity uh, and they act as this sort of gatekeeper and they control this sort of walled garden. Um, and what's really interesting to us is like, like you could have uh, uh, these users essentially operate a network and literally guide how the, how the software they use is developed if they can't even contribute it to it directly themselves. And uh, that's sort of the path we're looking uh, to go down. And I think that's going to be really fascinating uh, for, for this network of users to essentially operate uh, themselves. Um, and Carl touched upon this idea of uh, using a token to essentially hold a username within status. And that's kind of fascinating when you look at how other uh, sort of social networks have these sort of bots and spamming problems. Uh, you, like, uh, I, I believe it was some, I, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, but it's a very large amount of of Twitter users are essentially uh, bots, um, and they they don't really have a, any sort of financial stake against them. It, it's quite cheap to generate all these different accounts, um, and so in a way, you can kind of think about this as like Twitter verified accounts, but there's some kind of value attached to that, uh, and so the the more value you have to that, the more, the more stake they have in the network. Uh, the more influential they are in the network and therefore the more, the more valuable that particular user is in the network and the more reputable they are, in a, in a sense. Um, reputation itself is also quite subjective and quite hard, but this is like a sort of small step towards that kind of, kind of thing. Uh, and then you can imagine uh, later on, like there's going to be public chat groups which may be governed that only allow people of a certain uh, sort of uh, value amount to, to be able to enter. Um, and there's this idea of doing this sort of uh, tribute to, towards other people. Instead of blocking people within status, uh, you can essentially uh, uh, require some kind of deposit to even chat with you. Uh, so someone could deposit a certain amount, uh, and uh, then if you message with them, that sort of deposit's released. And so you, in, you can, if you want to block somebody, you can just set that value limit to be like nine 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 or something, some value that's ridiculously high. One part of that that I'd add is if you think of the sort of incentive alignment of a lot of these business models in Web2, where you have the owners of the network, you have the users on the network, and then more often than not, you have advertisers. And each of these different groups have very different interests. And then the result often isn't the best user experience. And if you can have more unified sort of stakeholders, um, hopefully the outcome would be much better. Yeah. Yeah. Um it, it, it would, would appear, at least on paper, these incentives become a lot more aligned. So basically, like what, what owning the status token could allow me to do is, um, it would give give me access to some features, right? Like being able mm -hmm. to re register my name or being able to chat with another user by making a deposit or things like that. So these are like feature based, right? So you have a token and you link the ownership of this token to unlocking some features in your application, right? Um, that's that's one use. And the other use is that I could participate in some form of governance of the application itself. Yep. 
And uh, so we, we kind of touched upon this idea of attention and community curation as well. Uh, so being a, a, a token holder, you will essentially be able to curate the sort of content that is displayed in, in status as well. Okay, so I can I can also curate content displayed in status. That's the that that that's that's very interesting, and that is where this idea of merging with user feeds come in, right? Like so, I'm a, I'm a I'm a content uh, I'm I'm a token owner. I can curate content, and based on how all the token owners curate this content status is, is going to display a feed of some form or something mm. like that yep so okay. things like the dap directory can be community curated as opposed to essentially being purely uh this gaming of an algorithm necessarily uh you, you, that happens very often in, in google play for example um if if uh, another part of that is if uh, if a particular algorithm is not be, uh, no longer serving your user, you can then fall back to a market of algorithms. Uh, so you can then swap them out and it becomes very Darwinian. So it keeps, hopefully it will keep these sort of algorithms honest and, and competitive as well. Status is a unique application, right? Like even in the chat, there isn't a central server that is like either collecting the data or, um, and you want to make things that are totally decentralized. So um, what is your business model? Assuming that it is not the coin itself. Uh, sure. So status, like uh, once we get the foundation right, the status, um, we will end up start working on these uh, default DApps, uh, basically things that we think are required uh, for the best user experience to onboard into. Uh, and so one of those is uh, a fiat to crypto exchange. Um, which is kind of tackling remittances in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that you, it's essentially a, a, a listing of buyers and sellers who are nearby, so you can exchange your cash for crypto and meet up at a cafe or or find some kind of uh, booth to do to do, to do this uh, for. Um, there's the there's going to be a sticker market as well later on, uh, which sounds somewhat trivial. But uh, if you look at the Line Messenger, it made up a quarter of their entire revenues for the last year. Um, so once you start looking at uh, users outside of the sort of crypto space, um, that becomes very, very interesting as well. I think like a lot of the sort of financial instruments are going to be very interesting. But for now, it's important that we just have a very, very solid base platform. So we don't want to spread ourselves too thin. So we just want solid developer tools, really nice messaging experience, the ability to send social payments in a wallet, and then we can begin like focusing on these these other models later. So before we wrap up, uh, this is so this is your 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 moment where you can rally the community and get them to join the project and do you know, ask them to do whatever you want. So. Um, what, what are you looking for today in terms of community outreach? I mean, are you looking for developers? Are you looking for, uh, you know, testers or what are, we, are you looking for application yeah, developers? Uh, yeah. I mean, like we're, we're always looking for developers. Um, if you're interested in like closure scripts uh, and react native, uh, and of, of course, Ethereum and cryptocurrencies, uh, definitely hit us up. Uh, we're all like, we, we need to expand our team quite aggressively soon. Um, the, we definitely need testers. I mean, we've kind of maxed out our, our test flight invites because uh, I don't know you got to 2,000. But if you're uh, on Android, it's a lot easier to get uh, try out the alpha. Um, you just need to go to test.status.im um, and give us your feedback. Giving the feedback is really easy. If you just see a bug or you have a, uh, some kind of feature suggestion, just shake your phone and uh, send it in. And, um, yeah, I think that's yeah, all I'd add to that is, yeah, we're just, we're actively hiring. Um, and the, way, the way we hire just because we're open source is we really value contributions to the project. Um, we also have this this really lovely community of people helping to support us. And if you go to slack.status.am, you can um, come on our Slack and, and come say hi. Yeah, I was impressed by just the size of your community. There's like 1,600 people in your, in your Slack channel or more, I guess. I mean, the how long have you what have you how, how did you do this how did you get all these people to uh to have such interest in the, in your project 
if you can give any advice to other open source projects out there? Oh, that's a good question. That's kind of a mystery to me. I think we we do sometimes do these these interviews with different dApps that we're interested in integrating with, and maybe people discover us that way. Um, perhaps just the the vision for what we're trying to build is exciting for people, and they they jump on our Slack through that. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I make an effort as much as possible to chat to almost everyone at least once who's in the community. Um, just to say hi and, and thank, for, thank us for supporting us and um, we're very Ethereum community focused. Uh, I think it's probably one of the best spaces like I've ever been in in my adult life. Well, that says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, uh, guys, thank you so much for coming on the show uh, and telling us about Sayus. We'll be looking forward to hearing you know the developments and uh, looking forward to the, the official release. Great. Thank you very much for thank having us. Thank you so us. much for having us. And thank you once again to our listeners for tuning in. Epicenter is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and lots of other great shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. Uh, obviously, if you're uh, if you're a listener of the show and you if you like the show, please leave us uh, an iTunes review. It helps uh, in others finding the show and helps us rank better in the iTunes rankings. Uh, you can also leave us a tip. The tipping address will be in the show description. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.